So uh, we've got Dr. Koner here with us today, and uh, he's from Germany. I remember how well everything is punctual. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I remember waiting at a train that was supposed to leave at, uh, at uh, 17 14 zero zero. And the conductor was sitting there looking at his clock with his hand up like this. True story, Thomas. And he goes around and he says, OK, it is now 7.15. Formal introduction now starts. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to have Thomas. He's been a very long-term friend and uh, a most unusual individual because he's clearly had his feet both in Europe as well as in the United States. So uh, Thomas has MD, PhD in regards to everything you need in regards to Germany. But rather than be settled with that after doing his residency, he decided that he wanted an experience in the United States. And so uh, he went to Baylor and worked with uh, Doug Polk in some of the most productive two years that I've ever seen out of that group. And he just came on like a storm, involved in uh, many, many studies and other things, and uh, had an incredible experience. Uh, and so with that, uh, he went back into academic ophthalmology in Germany. And a lot of you don't know the German system, but there are very, very few department chair positions that are open. And uh, it's just a handful of people that are allowed to get that opportunity to move on to be a chair. Now, it's not all of them are the same. Uh, there are many of them that are in the old previous East Germany. And in the previous East Germany, the feeling is, is that uh, uh, the opportunities aren't nearly as much as not nearly as important. So uh, he was uh, a fortunate and probably, at the time, about the only non-retinal person. You know, almost had to be retinally trained to be a chair, still is the case. Uh, and uh, he was selected as the chair at Frankfurt. has been working to build that program. Clearly one of the main programs, because Frankfurt is the financial center of Germany. And with Brexit, it could easily be the, uh, the uh, financial center of all of Europe, of what's ongoing. And uh, he's also very, very innovative, very research-oriented, all that he's done. He's associate <coughs> editor of the, of the journal Cat and Refractive Surgery, does an amazing job there. Uh, recently, previous president of the German Ophthalmology Society. He's now president of IIIC, which brought him here. They had a meeting in Aspen here just last week, so he was here for that. Um, a senior person in ESCRS. So there's not an area that you can't see he's had important presence. Now, the reason why the work he does in Europe is so important is Europe has got a different system, and they're able to see lenses, and they're able to see new technology, and they're able to work with it in ways that we can't do, and we don't have access to this. And he has clearly been an international leader in helping understand and do research on all this new technology. And so it's an honor to have uh, my good friend, uh, Professor Conan, here with that. And I, now I introduce, and we'll get started. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Randy, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, actually to be back here. And yes. we just talked with Eliana about it. It was actually 2011 I was here, so it's time fast. <clears throat> here are my financial disclosures. I learned this all over the world. You have to, first, second slide is financial disclosure. We work with a lot of companies. Um, of course, there are companies from Germany, from Europe, but also from the United States. And the development goes all around the world. Two words on my university. Yesterday we drove to, uh, through Salt Lake and uh, I asked at the end of the day, I went to a little pub, had one German beer there, <laughs> went to bed, and I asked the driver how many students you have in Salt Lake. And they said 30, 35,000, is that the right number? Now Frankfurt is with 48,000 the third biggest university town in Germany. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, um, 1749 to 1832. You see all what he has accomplished, biologist, polymath, theoretical physicist, and he gave this university the name. So it's a more than 100 years old university. This is the main building of the university. And the story behind this is it was a headquarters where Hitler produced a lot of his stuff for actually fighting. When the Second World War was over, this was the headquarter of the United States. And in, this, in, the main, in the main building, just when you enter this, on the left side, there is still a room called the Eisenhower Room, because Eisenhower actually came there and they made the division for Germany in four parts. You remember maybe that. Now, when the United States and the troops went back, 
uh, it was like it's in the 80s and the uh, 90s, they basically donated the whole area to the Frankfurt town. And then the town of Frankfurt was so clever not to basically divide it because this is land, it's in the center of Frankfurt, we talked about, it's very, you know, we are a small country compared to your country. And, and the, the, the property is so expensive now. I just told Randy yesterday, if you have bought a, a building in Germany or an area for one million euros, you most likely can sell it now. <coughs> 10 years ago, you sell it for two to three million because it's so crowded. Now, the, the, the Frankfurt city actually denoted this to the university and therefore we have one of the biggest campi in Europe. Now, we are a little bit outside of that. That is the main building, Universitätsklinikum, that's a German name. We have uh, all the clinics there, like you have here, the big campi, on internal medicine surgery. And on the right side, this is the old building. It's, it's a very traditional one. It's, uh, the, the Department of Ophthalmology has seen five chairs. I'm the fifth chair of this. Everybody is there for 20 years, approximately. That's the story. OK, so my topic is today a topic I really like. And that is um, because there's so much going on in accommodation and in presbyopia. And we know that worldwide, many, many people are actually, well, suffering from this problem, and more will to come. Now, this is a paper from the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, and I put this together, surgical correction of presbyopia. We have used, and worldwide, a lot of options on the cornea. But we know that the, the, the real, the natural place is the lens. And I would like to summarize in my talk, not the op options there. We worked on a little bit on eczema pro uh, profiles and mm -hmm presbyopia treatment in the cornea, but now at the moment the most, the area is lens technology, and there are a lot of lenses, and I would love to go a little bit through this. Monovision in the United States is used, um, monofocal IOL corrected for 0 0.75 to minus 1.25, um, in the US is even two diopters, but, but all this I think depends on the preoperative evaluation, because you have to see if one eye is for distant, the other one is for near, if the patient tolerates this. Um, the success rate is between, I would say, 80% of patients. Uh, this was an older paper with contact lenses, one refractive surgery here from the United States in 2001. And there's a recent paper from Graham Barrett's group. I was invited to give a, main, a named lecture in Australia last year. And um, we talked with Graham about it. He's a big, big friend of Monovision. And here's a paper, small group, 26 patients. Um, i just go through this a little bit quicker. They achieved 92% achieved uh, Jaeger 4 or better. Uh, good stereopsis in their cases. No patient required intra lens exchange or other refractive procedures. And the outcome here was spectacle independence, 88%. Um, of course, if you have this, you don't have to struggle with any type of optical disturbances with all the lenses, which I will talk now in, in the next, in the next uh, 20 minutes. But um, what is also true is that not everybody likes monovision. If you can test it in refractive procedures, you can do it. But in cataracts, it's pretty difficult. If they have a dense cataract, you cannot test for it. And some of them losing stereopsis. They cannot drive because it's too different. Not every human being can really use monovision for their advantage. So the big area is the uh, type of intraocular lenses. And I put this here, a monofocal lens in the upper part. You see on the right side the the, 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 vision, the, the system here, how it was on the optical bench. In the middle, multifocal lenses with several foci, and then the extended depths of focus lenses. You have them here as a symphony <coughs> lens. You will have an extended depth. And I would like to go particular to the two areas of multifocal and extended depths of focus, because that's a very interesting. Um, Randy pointed this out. I was um, in the United States, did a fellowship here in Baylor. But when I was a medical student, um, the German system runs like this. You do five years of medical training. And the last year, the sixth year, you actually do a um, practical year. Do four months of education and surgery, four months in internal medicine, and four months of a subject you can choice, choose. And I choose at this time Minneapolis because we had a connection at Bonn where I was doing the medical studies. I went to Bill Rasburn. He, he was a researcher in the field of cataract. My father, doctor father in Germany, sent me to this as Hans Reinhard Koch, you know, the, the, the guy who's suturing the iris prosthesis and these things. I was there for two weeks and then I decided, well, I cannot see four months in the lab just doing my practical year. So I went to the department, I went to the grand rounds, and the, the, the boss of this department this time was Dick Lindstrom. 
And Dick Lindstrom took me on, you know, we, we, we worked there together. That was my first experience. And actually at this time was just a 3M bifocal intraocular lens. It was first it's in the, the 90s, 1990 in this region. And then I had a lot of experience. You see this here, all, all types of eyewires. I would like to go through this. Multifocal lenses, and I think the journey is here. When I came back to Frankfurt, we started on a real FDA trial on the Risto lens in 2000. That was a three-piece diffractive uh, epidized plus four diopter lens. And then we get to a lot of iterations. I mean, we worked with other companies, but I just took this as an example. So Alcon produced all these type of lenses from plus four to plus three, two and a half, the, uh, epidized lenses, then with filters, then <laughs> touristy. But I can tell you from the point now, we don't use bifocal lenses anymore. And the reason is we have other lenses. You will have them, I think, pretty much soon, and it's time that you will have them. Um, the, other, the other group is extended depth of focus. I came a little bit later to this. So my talk is, first of all, I talk about the trifocus, then I will talk about the uh, EDOF lenses. Now, the trifocal principle is here. You will have, in the upper part, that's the Zeiss model, three foci, one for far, one for near, and in between an intermediate. When I first saw the concept, I said, that cannot work because the brain cannot understand this. I implanted the first trifocal lenses actually in a physician. He came to me, he heard of this lens, it was 2011. Uh, this was one of my only donations, <laughs> Randy, I got from him. I got a little donation for our department when I had implanted the two lenses. He's so happy. It's now eight years. He just was recently at uh, follow-up with it. And then there is a quadrifocal principle, which most likely will the first one, you will get here approval. I come to this. Now, the thing is here, if you do an MDF curve, this is a paper from Gatinel. He is one of the owners of the patterns of the uh, trifocal lens. You can see that at the intermediate, you have this extra dip. And when you think about it, you say that the brain cannot really work with this, but, but the thing is actually it works. And there are two things which I will point out. Is first of all, if you do a defocus curve, you can see that the normal defocus curve, which goes like this, every human being has for distance and near, and in between he can focus, accommodate. The second thing is if you have three foci, then everybody interferes with each other. So the distance with the intermediate, the intermediate with the near, and the patient cannot really tell what, they, they, cannot, they can the just not say they have three foci. And I know it so very well because my mom has a trifocal lens in her eyes and I'm talking her with her all the time. This is the iteration. If people from the United States, I'm sorry to say that I give this talk very often, but see, these are the options we have, and there are more to come. There are even a seven, six, and the seven trifocal technology with different intermediate uh, steps, and you see, I don't want to go to all of them. I have personal experience. This is my, one of my first lens started in 2011 with a trifocal lens. It's a plate haptic design hydrophilic lens from Zeiss. And this is a German company, but it's very strong, of course, in the United States, developing, you all know the IOL Master, uh, the technology we use here, a variant system um, for actually placing this, and I'm most likely exclusively use this. Now, this is a paper in AJO I published, and uh, they were very interested uh, in the paper, and this was, first of all, uh, on this side, the outcome shows that if you look at the pre-op, uh, was pretty much some of them in the myopic range, hyperopic range, 54 eyes. We looked at this afterwards, I have to go to this a little bit further, that still patients have halos, they have symptoms, but let me talk to this a little bit later. If you see here the defocus curve, that's actually what makes these lenses so special. The patients can really see in distance, in, near, but also intermediate, and therefore they like it so much. 12% occasionally near correction. Everything else was without glasses, for intermediate, for distance. And then if I go back one slide, I, the, 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 the questionnaire optical quality uh, was pretty good in the range of seven to eight on a scale up to 10, but patients overall very happy. Otherwise, we would not have come into the opportunity to implant a lot of them. Since this, I have not explanted a trifocal lens, 2011. That's a long time of my own, and I will show you how many we have done. This is a paper I did with one of my fellows. We looked also for high myopia. We compared it to a group of normal eyes to high myopia. And the overall thing, it also works in high myopia. I cannot go into detail of this papers. Uh, this is also published in the Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery. Now, 3rd of July 2015, I had the pleasure to be the first surgeon in the world who implanted the panoptics from Alcon. 
This is the lens here, you can see it. It's a blue filter IOL, trifocal technology, quadrifocal technology. And sure to say, we also put our first data together. We published again in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. The principle is here that you have a quadrifocal lens and the first, the, the, the first foci is actually uh, transferred to the distance image and makes it a trifocal lens as well. The lens is on the right side. This is a three months follow up. We were pretty much on target for emetropia. You have to get these lenses on emetropia. Here's the thing, and again, the defocus curve, you can see this. And the only thing what people see is the halos. This is what I tell everybody. You will have halos in the beginning, but they re de decrease. They decrease over time. And I have not seen really a patient who really after three to six months actually cannot. When this lens comes to the market, and I think I put, here's a comparison of the penfocal and trifocal. We also published this year, this year in Journal Cataract and Infractive, or last year. And the main difference is just if you look at the defocus curve at 60 centimeters, 60 to 50, the pen optics does a little bit better. And I think that the computer, you know, the, the area is usually 60 centimeters rather than 80 centimeters. And that's, that's the main difference besides the materials in this. Now this, I, I, I submitted this article, yes, I think two days or seven days ago to ophthalmology because it's the biggest study prospective multicenter international single arm non-randomized study, 167 eyes of the panoptics lens. The outcome is here. Basically, that we have demonstrated the same. I have to rush a little bit through this. No serious uh, adverse events, but again, very good at near, intermediate, and distance. Uh, and the Acrosoft provided good visual acuity of at least 20, 25. And here's the focus curve from this study. Very, very much the same what we found. So I'm, I think you will have this, I don't know when it will happen, but most likely end of this year, beginning of next year or something. I think 20, what I've heard is 2020. 2020. Well, be second or third quarter. Or ah, so, so middle of next year. And I can tell you this will change multifocal technology in the United States because you will see that it will be better than Ristor or the, the, the Technus multifocal lens because these are all bifocal lenses. I come at the, at the end a little bit about what, what, what a little bit my pearls are. Rainer has uh, produced here something. Now everybody fights a little bit how should the optical zone size be. We just were at the, the Aspen meeting, Triple IC. There's a new company from East uh, Europe. They do a with even smaller optical zone. So we have to figure this out, what is really the best technology. You see, here's a new trifocal uh, with different step additions, intermediate 1.5, 1 1.75, 1 1 1.66, 2.17. So they're playing around with these intermediate foci. And this is just basically showing that the, the uh, also one point of the trifocal lens is it uses the light better than the bifocal lenses. Here is this 92 effective light transmission. That's better than in the bifocal, which is like 84, 85%. Okay, and then even a little bit further, which you will have not so, so quickly, but I show you this. It's this add-on technology. It's very interesting because here's a pseudophagic patient and he came to our department to me and asked for, uh, for uh, presbyopia correcting IOLs or basically for spectacle independence. And what we have to our availability is now an add-on technology. It's a second IOL. You put the trifocal lens on top of a monofocal lens and can make every monofocal system trifocal. And I do this here and you can see the trifocality as an add-on lens. It has no power, it's basically a trifocal lens. You can even take a plus one or minus one or a little bit of astigmatism, so you can correct any refractive error, residual refractive error, and put this lens in. Also, this has to be worked out, but the principle, I think, is very interesting. Is that in the sulcus? It's a sulcus lens. You put that's it the in the, that's the It's a Rainer lens, it's a sulcus lens, but there's a first Q. We have two other, uh, already three other companies who provide this add-on technology. This is one of the Rainer lens published uh, uh, in uh, this year, source from Amon. So also, it's starting to be not, not much publications at the moment. So my pearls for trifocal lenses is basically, I use them when I have really healthy eye. So no pathology on the cornea, because if you have, and I think that's true for any multifocal lens, if you have irregularities on the cornea, or let's say Fuchs dystrophy, that's not a good case. Macular pathology is not a good case. And the patient should have a high demand on vision in all distances and request for spectacle independence. If a patient comes and doesn't want to have spectacle independence, I think you just give him a monofocal lens, he takes glasses. But I can tell you, over the years now, over the last, I would say, 10 years, 
the request from people becomes every day more and more. More people come and say, we have heard you're doing this and successful, and you come. And so it's very good. There are contraindications, coronary diseases, as I said, you know, severe glaucoma, retinal diseases, that, that's, they have other problems with other words. You give them better monofocal lens. Now, the extended depths of glaucoma, I'm, Randy, we, we just put together a paper with the nomenclature paper of extended depths of focus, and the interesting thing is there are four types, and not everybody knows this. It's a small aperture. You can see the IC8. There is a bioanalogic of the Illumina. There is a diffractive and the non-diffractive. At the moment, you only have diffractive eye wells, and basically they say, <laughs> J&J &J say this is not a multifocal lens. It's, it's a diffractive lens, and in the future, we know already that at the ESCRS or maybe at the beginning of next year, big company Icon comes with a non-diffractive, and that will be also a game changer, I believe, because the benefits of these lenses are ex excellent distance vision, improved near intermediate, function we call it functional near vision, and I show you this why it is an optical quality in front of depend really on the lens design. If you have a non-diffractive system, I, I expect I have not implanted one of them, but as there will be less optical disturbances. So here's the IC8. This is also an interesting concept because what it, you know, the camera implant, I think that's the OcuFocus is approved in the United States, but they have put the same thing into the eye well. So you, you fold the eye well, you bring it in the, in the capsular bag, and now we have this principle of small aperture. Booker Dick has published here a paper on this, and they also found very good, as summarizes, small aperture with some kind of myopia, so a little bit of monovision, but also happy patient. Now, it's a beast. It's a little 3.5 millimeter incision. So I'm not using it currently for my rear presbyopia patient, but I'm using it at this type. When I have a patient, for example, RK, or let's say a patient with a catechonus or a highly aberrated cornea, this is fantastic because it blocks all the aberrations and you still have a depth of focus. So that's, that's a really good advantage for those patients. Lumina, uh, an accommodative eyewear, they call it. You see this here, publication, uh, also an AGO. Uh, we have no experience in the, with this. It's uh, from the Netherlands. But we have experience with actually the um, Miniwell. It's a, it's a technology from Italy. Therefore, it's so interesting because many company, many countries also come with this. This is the lens my uncle has in his eye because he wanted this extended depth of focus. Also very happy. And we have published on the Symphony. I don't have to show you this. This is a normal case here. Uh, I think you have seen this all. This is a foldable lens, hydrophilic material. And I put it here into the folder. The outcome is published in a, a British journal. It's called the Eye. Uh, we published the visual performance. And you can see the defocus curve. And you see the outcome. And we had 100% patients with spectic independence for distance and intermediate, and 71 for near. So 30% still need something. And I'll come to this in a minute. The Zeiss technology, they have taken this idea of the trifocal lens, put it on, on that next technology, and put a, a depth, the extended depth of focus, they called the Lara lens in Europe. And we just have published, or we just basically put this together and on our way to publish this uh, for, for this type of lens. So indications for this are basically those patients, in my opinion, who cannot get a trifocal lens. And these are patients who maybe want to have less optical phenomena, but it's really not true. If I compare a symphony to a panoptic, it's pretty much the same of optical phenomena. I think that, that the companies here fool us, and I usually like to see my own data, then I can tell you what's, what's really true. Uh, optical phenomena compared to monofocal lenses, is not really true, that's, as patients say that. Spectic independence for far and intermediate. Maybe for, for intermediate, a little bit better than for the, for the trifocal lens. So if somebody really wants just a computer and not really reading, then you could argue to go with this lens. But I think they said reading glasses. Here's a comparison. I was just uh, a couple of weeks ago in Italy, and from Florence department, Rita uh, Mancucci published this article. They compared the symphony, the panoptics, and the trifocal. Uh, Acrylisa, and they found that the trifocal have better near visual acuity, and I can agree on this, and they found that the EDOF had better contrast sensitivity. I'm a bit critical. I think that this is pretty much the same, but okay, that's published here, and you see the photopic uh, contrast sensitivity data. Finally, on, on this type of lens, I would like to bring one, one type of lens. It's called the segmental refractive multifocal IOLs. You can see in the lower part, it looks like a bifocal glass. You have an addition 
of plus three diopters. Roberto Saldivar talked about it. It's, we call this the plus three, but there's also a version of plus 1.5, and it's called the comfort lens. And he talked at the Aspen meeting that he basically no monofocal lens anymore. He has 100% of premium lenses because he gives this lens with a plus 1.5 in every patient because they have no optical phenomena because it's just two parts of the lens, no diffraction, no uh, refraction. It's basically these lenses. And we published also in AJO, again, this with very good outcome, even better than with the Symphony, high patient satisfaction, 72% with spectral independence. The downside of this material, the hydrophilic material, there was a big crisis in Great Britain because they had to explant a lot of these lenses, and most likely they come to you. For calcification. If you have calcification, most likely Liana has seen a lot of them. But they have, I think they have solved this issue. They have solved it over the now, and the process is better. This is an interesting slide, and we also put this, it was just accepted for publication. Again, always this defocus curve. And you can see in the upper part, it's in, basically it's the panoptics, it's the acrylisa, it's a symphony, and it's a segmental. And you see in dark blue is a symphony, and that demonstrates what happens. You need most likely reading glasses if you have a symphony kind of EDOF lens. You can maybe work a little bit with monovision, but also not so easy. But usually the patients require this, and we have to uh, tell that in the, in the beginning is always better. <clears throat> this may be interesting for you. These are 3,193 slides as of July. My own cases, always femto. Over the time from 2012 to 19, it summarizes the lenses. And if I put this together, it's 35% monofocal lens and 65% presbyopia correcting IOLs in this group. Now, it, it goes from basically monofocal spheric, toric lens, and then it goes to the symphony, it goes to Lara, Lisa, and panoptic. Lara, Lisa, we have the longest, therefore we have the most implication. Panoptics we have at the moment, just 408. And you also see that there's also a bar with toric. So I can tell you, if I put 100 lenses of panoptics, one third will be toric, because we have to correct astigmatism, I come to this. Now, it's very difficult to choose these lenses from all this. Not every patient fits everybody, so we do quite a selection and big of talking with all the patients. Maybe we can do this in the discussion. Couple pearls. Preoperative evaluation is very important. Tomography, endothelial cell count, macrof I don't do these lenses when I have not seen this outcome. No with OCT, endothelial cell measurement, tomography, because you have to exclude uh, irregular astigmatism. Dry eye is a real big problem. Then the postoperative refraction has to be amotropic. If you don't, if you cannot achieve amotropia, then you have to do refractive surgery. And many surgeons in Germany basically do cataracts, and we talked about it, and intervitreal ejection. That's all they do, and they have no access to eczema surgery. And then the patients aren't happy because if a patient is minus one or plus one, you have to do something later, after three months, six months. Centration is important, therefore I think that we're going in the direction of more computerized surgery. We don't want this tilt of lenses because of smaller capsule, larger capsule rexes. So the computerized medicine, I think, will help us. And very important is information. I always tell, in comparison to the bifocal, you have intermediates, very good, but you still will have optical phenomena. If you don't have this, then most likely I haven't implanted that lens in your eye. And they will decrease over time. And we don't explant these lenses, and we let the brain work into it. But you have to good, a, a good uh, selection criteria. Couple other pearls, um, optimization of the surface is important. So any patient's dry eye, we have to do this. I put this together, there's a big scheme here, it's published also um, in Journal Cataract Reflective 2017, preoperative optimization of the ocular surface disease before cataract surgery. The second thing is, and I'm sure you do all this, you, you have to work on the IOL formula. We have basically abandoned SRKT, all the old formula. I mean, that's the third generation. There's a very interesting series, if you're interested, in the journal Cataract Effective Surgery. Four editorials on this topic last year. Doug Koch was one of these, Adi Abliafia, Graham Barrett, I think. And we looked at the panoptics data. We published this also, nine for modern formulas. And we found that the Barrett Universal, the Hill, RBF, the Olsen, from Denmark and the two, T2 formula are the best for us to get emetropia as much. So we're working with the new formulas. Third thing is 
astigmatic correction. If you believe that a, mon uh, a trifocal lens will work with 1.5 astigmatism, you will see that the patient is unhappy. So either you have a toric version or you have to do eczema surgery afterwards or limbal relaxing or something. But you have to, and this is a nice paper from Hayashi who shows that not only the distance visual acuity goes down when you have astigmatism post but also the near visual acuity. Everything goes down when you have increased amounts of astigmatism. So the astigmatism should be below 0 0.5. Okay, this can, rotation of the eye wells. Interesting study from uh, Japan, from uh, Tetsuro, also a good friend of mine. Uh, he showed that basically these lenses rotate and, and the best time to re-rotate lenses are most likely between seven and 14 days. Uh, in the beginning, we made that mistake, a toric lens, three diopters, first day off axis because we dilated the pupil. We tried to rotate the lens. Next day after the first rotation, same thing because the lens rotates in the same direction again. That's not very good. And so we do this re-rotation seven days. And the little trick what I do now is since, since maybe a year, after surgery, when I have toric lenses, I let these patients really lie down for an hour. They don't have to move. We close the pupil with myotics so that the lens really gets into place and let them, in comparison to all the monofocal lenses, the activities should be down in the first two, three days. Because if they do too much of movement, we also know that this trick with the lying down, the, the highest rotation uh, occurs in the first hour after surgery. It's not the next day, it's the first hour after surgery. And then I talked about this effect of manual capsorexis, you want good centration, and I want to skip this. Only eyes with a severely malformed capsorexis had a highly or slightly deformed uh, descended IOL, and if you have these systems, the, the trifocal systems uh, descended, it's not good because they do not perform very well. Now, finally, this is not European style, it's, I think it comes from the US, but a little bit on this. This is the holy grail. We want to look at the accommodative eyewells in the future. I think that's, that's the way where we all want to go in the next, and, and many companies have worked on this. I go to this, this is the one CU from um, a company in Germany, accommodative, it's a big hype, 15 years ago, 2003, they published this, um, but they showed some accommodation. No accommodation, I think happened. You in the United States have the Bausch & Lomb lens. Everybody thinks an accommodative eyewear. We in Europe, we used it for maybe one or two years and we abandoned it because it just was not working in our hands. And I always have this discussion. I have Europeans call it the lens that only works in the United States. Nah, that's something like, you know, but, but you know, there's the accommodation here and this has not really worked. And then there were Tetraflex. I've just put this by comfort lens also haven't worked. And the pilot study of focus shift principle in one design haven't worked. Uh, the synchrony, I think this was a product from J&J &J or uh, Elegan, uh, big beast also, big implant, but also was not very successful. So new lens is a new technology, but basically what we found, and that is a paper from 2011, that so far we have no really accommodative IOL. <coughs> Um, not everybody who reads will accommodate because many of them work with pseudo accommodation and sometimes of astigmatism. So, and we also have no good studies, lack of good study design, prospective randomized. Now, I think there are two interesting implants which come up. This is Power Vision. I think this is a company which was acquired at least in a shared by Alcon. Uh, I have no information about this, I've never seen this lens. First, through shape changing, fluid driven. So, there's a fluid around this lens and it changes the the lens itself. And then I work with also with a company called Uwine. It's a, this two-part system. I think I can better show this here. Uh, it's an interesting concept where basically the capsorexis is done. Um, the lens, the, the, the outer lens is implanted into the eye. I think you have done these studies here as well. And then the second lens is put into the caps in, into this lens, into the first lens. And then you can see uh, some accumulative process because we know that the cilia body works, we know that the, the, the zonules still work even after surgery, but the problem is that we don't have lenses. Now, this is an interesting, from some implants they have done, I think in, in Central America, and you can see in blue the, the curve, now you were familiar with the defocus curve, you see in blue the lens gen, called the lens gen, it's better than the symphony, much better in near distance visual acuity, 
And also there are three points which are intriguing in this. First of all, it seems that this lens keeps very much the effective lens plane, the position. That means not much of deviation in post optical refraction. The second thing is no, not much rotation. This is a one month, a 33 months just example. And then what is very interesting is this goes over enhanced cataract pristine capsule. The capsule most likely maintains very clear even after 50 months because the whole capsule bag is filled. So that's just you know interesting data and I'm really looking forward to this. And also these lenses will most likely will have an, uh, an opportunity to have this base lens and then you can put anything what you want. You can put even a trifocal technology or you can put a toric lens, anything. If it would accommodate, then it's good. But it's, I think that the second line of this lens technology is actually you have this and other companies also have this. So I would like to summarize. I hope I was not too long. The Presbyo correcting IOL is my take home message. Monovision, 80% work, 80% satisfied. But I think that there are some problems with this. Not everybody can tolerate. Not everybody is spectacle independence. You still need reading glasses most of the time. So there is a big you know, hype now on trifocal lenses. And trifocal lenses work if you really have good situation in terms of uh, medical, uh, medical uh, situations like good cornea, good uh, retina, uh, basically a healthy eye. The EDOF lenses we use most of the time if patients want to have more good or better computer distance because I think they're a little bit better and we also use them in irregular corneas. We use them post LASIK because they are more forgiving in terms of the refractive outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and that, therefore this is a good choice as long as we don't have good formulas to give us the trifocal lenses. And I think trifocal lens post refractive surgery works but not in a minus eight or minus 10 diopter because the cornea is highly aberrated or on a plus four hyperopic patients. They only work, I think, in my opinion, in the lower amounts of refractive procedure, maybe hyperopia plus two and, and myopia up to minus five or something. But more research needs to be done. And then a very exciting field, I think, is accommodative IOL. Currently, we have really nothing also in Europe available, but there are new IOLs to come. And of course, human beings and researchers work there for a long time. We don't know where it will end up, but this is the holy grail because these lenses will have no optical system, no optical phenomena, and would most likely be the lenses of choice if they would work. Thank you. So great lecture, and uh, it's amazing that you can have that experience. Uh, obviously, our big problem is a lot of those smaller companies in Europe <clears throat> will never come to the United States because they're unwilling to spend the amount of money it takes and the difficulty of getting through FDA, which is a whole other story. Yeah. So here's a tough one. I'm going to ask you a really tough question. You have access to lots of technology, everything else in place, knowing about it and having all these patients. And I know you're doing about 2,000 surgeries a year, so that's, he's, a very, <laughs> he's not just talking about it. He's a very, very busy surgeon. Which of the new technology lenses, if you needed cataract surgery, would you put in your own eye today? Well, this is a question I would uh, very, get very often. I know, Randy, that my cataract surgery comes up in between, I would say, approximately 20 years. And the reason is my both parents have the same, they have cataract surgery when we were 75 both. Right. So you're, so. you're, so you're going to be young, fairly young. Well, so I have to make, I don't have to make this, but if I would have to make it today, well, then it would be a really tough one. And I... Um, I, I would be still a little bit afraid, I have to say, an optical phenomena. I really would be afraid. I hear that the, the patients who really want to be spectacle independent, the, the type of patients which really love this is, I, I would say, very active people. They go for golfing. They, 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 they still work on the computer. They read a little bit. They do everything. There's this perfect lens, a trifocal lens, I would say. If really somebody wants to be spectacle independence, the best lens is a trifocal lens. You can argue, do you have panoptics or you do a Zeiss? This is a little bit also your preference because the plate haptic design one is three-paste design. Um, but the results are pretty similar. Si pretty similar and, and both work very well. Patients are very, very happy. I, I have not never seen so many happy multifocal patients and since we have the trifocal lens. It's really totally game changer. You will see that when it comes here. The EDOF lenses at the moment, I. Personally, I would only most likely go with this when we have the non-diffractive ones. So I wait for next year because Arcon comes with a new platform like this. Minivel is a good other op opportunity. And 
Then for the highly aberrated eyes, I think that the ICH is a very good opportunity, you know, because it blocks this light. So it would be three <coughs> categories, and most likely I would go for the first one because my eye is highly visual functional. I have 1.6 visual acuity, 20, 15, even now, so a bit difficult for me. But I know one of our colleagues from Italy, right. uh, Matteo Piavella, ah, sure. has a trifocal lens does work on the surgery, microscope every day. He loves it. He was just at the meeting, and I can remember when he had the lens. It was also eight years ago, perfectly doing surgery with it. So it's not a contraindication. Hiroko from, from Japan tells me she's expanded eye wells in multifocal area as well in Japan. And she has a lot of you know physicians, dentists, uh, engineers, and, and it works also with them. So the, the big fear, I think, is over now. You just have to know how to handle the complications. And the complications is residual refractive error, dry eye. Uh, you don't dislocate. I'm, what, I, what I have to say is you have to work on the surgical technique. I mean, this is much more different. So for the residents, you have a capsule rupture in a second eye after trifocal lens. That's a real problem because the first eye has a trifocal lens. The second eye, you cannot put this lens. And there is no of these lenses currently in the sulcus. We don't have a sulcus lens available. We also talk with the companies there but it's not very profitable field for them because the right. most of surgeons only use one out of thousand. So you have to get this lens into the capsule bag and it becomes even more difficult if it's a toric version mm -hmm. because a toric version you cannot rotate, you have to put it at a special place. So then refractive surgery comes into play, you can do corneal surgery. We have great outcomes now with a, with a trans PRK, with the LASIK procedures there, isn't smile. So we have three options, all very good in terms of the outcomes at this moment. Um, so that's important to, to know this. And you have to listen to your patients. We, if they are not really happy, we bring them in all the time. We listen to them. We don't say that so we, we understand you. We know that they have to, we told this to you. But let's wait before. And then very often after two months, after three months, if a patient really suffers, even for the trifocal lens, then all of a sudden he says, well, I don't understand this. But since yesterday, everything is much better. And that is right. not new right. adaptation. Right. Yeah. And it just happens. It, I also, we do, cannot really, I, I cannot uh, explain it, but the realistic thing, that, that's what happens. Thomas, um, thank you very much for the overview, it was great. So we are hearing now much more about these eye hands from J&J. &J. Yes. Why do you think this fits there? Because they claim it's an adopt lens, but the mechanism seems to be so different, like they have like a central zone. Yeah, so it's where a, do you think it's a prolate, a little bit prolate surface. They have changed the surface technology and they give you a little of depth of focus induction, but it's more, uh, it's a monofocal lens with a little bit more intermediate. It's not really as EDOF lens, but it enhances a little bit, not seeing at one, but you can see a little bit further. So it, it comes again, taking from the monofocal lenses away, but it definitely has a change of the, con we, we looked at these lenses in the lab and if you see this lens, a monofocal lens, same type, the technus versus the eye hands, you can see that they have a little bump on it. So it's an optical process on the, on the, on the center of the, of the anterior surface. So it just started in Europe as well. You know, it's maybe half a year that we have it. And people, the, the question is, is it a premium eye well? We, we, everything what is in this area, we have, we have the same situation like in the United States, we can <coughs> upcharge. So patients get the basic, um, basic thing from the company, from the from the insurance company, cataract surgery and and monofocal lens, spheric monofocal lens, not even aspheric. Everything else is an upcharge. Aspheric are not much, but a little bit. And then femto is upcharge, and everything goes in this direction. And then they can choose. And I think, looking through Europe at least, this is the best system you can have. Because for example, my colleagues in Austria, where where we go very often, but they, they the only option they have either. You take the cost as, as, as the university or the, as, as the hospital. You just give it for free, but then your margin is, is crazy. Or the patient has to pay the whole procedure itself, himself, mm -hmm. which I did four years, five years ago. When I used this lens, everybody had to pay because I had no other chance. Now, since we have this upcharge or this, yeah, that, that's really good. And, and many companies, I was in, in, in Poland, uh, one of my colleagues gave a lecture there in Katowice University. And what happens with them is, because the, 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 the government does not allow this upcharge, all the patients are now going to Czech Republic to get their surgery done. Because they, nobody in Poland is allowed to do it. So all the patients... Crazy. It's crazy. One more question. Yeah. 
How do you approach functionally monocular patients, amblyopia? Maybe someone has a kind of trace ERM in one eye, but they're re they really, really want a multifocal in their health. Yes. Okay, so monocular trifocality works. And we very often, I'm, I'm, I'm not putting trifocal lenses between below an expected visual acuity of 20, 25, 20, 30. That's not a good, because the light splitting is too much. And I would not go for a tri, for an eat of lens below, below 20, 40. Below this amount, I always would go for monofocal lens. But if you have an amblyopic eye, which 20, 80 or 20, in this range, you give him a monofocal lens and you can easily do a trifocal lens in the other eye. Surgically, technique have to be good. And I'm not afraid of taking out a lens if it's, if it's necessary. With these lenses nowadays, you know, if you do it early, an IOL exchange, there's always a risk of, you know, infection and everything. But with all respect, we can do this now and we just can explant the lens if the patient will. <laughs> and I always, you know, the same thing is don't perform yak capsulotomy. Many physicians do this early because they think that this is the holy grail for making it better. No, just make sure that you do a good technique, keep the lens in place, wait three months, maybe five months, and <coughs> before you do the yak, take the lens out if the patient is not happy. If the patient was happy in the beginning, very happy, and three months later had an opacification, then you can yak him because that's, that's the other story around it. But you said explantation for you with these new lenses is, is becoming it's, extremely it's, rare. It's rare, but you know, in this special, when you're not so sure at the moment also, I'm also tell the patient it's not the end of the world. If you really don't like it, we still can go take the same type of lens. I have the same lens. I just give you an aspheric lens we have the preloaded Clarion at this point, you know. We just take it out, everything is, is already preset, just take it out, put the new lens, should not be a problem. But one eyed patient, oh, you know, it's always it's difficult to say, but I would say that, but I would, we do this. We do it now with, with great success. And good morning. Good morning. Yeah. More importantly, you had to make a four and a half millimeter incision, so we always screwed up the corneas. It was not a very effective lens, that dual accommodating lens. And we're doing the panoptic, and that's been so far real. Yeah. Well, I th no, I, I think that with the trif with all these with these fixed systems, the trifocal lens, the Edof lenses, the the advantage will be always the optical system. You put it in, and it can work for forty years because you know it, it always can work. Whereas with all the accommodative eyewells, the problem is the function. Do we really at the end will achieve this? But you know, Alan, that that the companies are behind it, and the development goes in this direction. And I think everybody wants to be you know, wants to have these type of lenses. So it's an interesting field. And maybe we, as I, I, I'm sure one day we will have the answer. It's just a question of months, years, decades. I don't know. <laughs> so true. Any other questions? Thomas, it's an absolute pleasure to have you.